Hey guys, good morning. Uh, this is for art appreciation and going over uh, craft media. Um, the craft media that we'll be looking at in the PowerPoint in particular will be several. One is clay, uh, another word for clay is ceramics. And also we'll be looking at glass and metal and textile and wood. And <clears throat> Whenever we're talking about metal, I just want to specify the difference. Um, we're going to be looking at different types of alloys or metals that aren't typically used in the fine art realm. Um, whenever we talk about metal sculpture in fine art, we often um, are referring to bronze in particular. And whenever we discuss the craft media uh, with metal, we're talking more about... Um, different alloys like alumina and so on and so forth. So whenever we get into metal, just try to differentiate the different or differentiate between how large sculptures have been casted in history with bronze and it's considered fine art, but a craft media with metal that's being used is a way to um, kind of transition the use of lower quality metals into a finer art realm and that kind of segues into the importance of this chapter in that this chapter really talks about these craft medias which are often used for uh, functional or useful objects or utilitarian objects around the household um, and finding a way to transition that mentality of these materials or these medias can only be used for useful utilitarian functions. For example, clay can be used more than just as a pot or a piece of pottery in the home. It can um, be uh, mutated or changed or shifted or adjusted in a way to fit the category of what is a fine art or what is a visual art. Um, same with woodworking. Uh, woodworking is not just a bowl or a bowl that's been uh, turned on a lathe or a chair that is used as a functional useful object in the home, which is equally important, but it also can be used as a way to, like with clay, to transition into the fine art a category or elements or uh, uh, definitions of fine art and visual arts. So again this class is about finding appreciation in the visual arts and this is a way to take a categorized material or a medium like clay or wood or uh, metals like even silverware and uh, textiles as well as glass and understand that they can be used in their original function as a at home element to a gallery exhibition uh, location uh, placement as well. So we'll be getting into all of that but just just remember that this is very much about how that transition between what is craft and what is art and these materials and these objects that we'll look at uh, really will help to explain uh, the difference, okay? And then also where that cusp is in between, um, where it shifts in between the idea of craft as a useful object at home and art as a useful object for society, for social commentary. All right, so uh, we'll first start with clay, and I have a pretty extensive clay background. Uh, clay is what is found in the earth, but whenever you start to use clay and make an object out of clay, and you fire it, and then you put a glaze on it, that's what makes it become ceramics because it starts to have a history. It starts to have a functional history, meaning that you are functioning in dialogue as well as in body with the material. So you take a inert source that's in the earth, uh, which is very much a big part of the earth, the lithosphere of the earth, where it's heavily uh, deposited with silica. And that material 
is transformed through your ideas and through your concepts, either through just your hands and tools or a potter's wheel, which you will throw on the wheel and make a different functional forms, meaning that they have a sense of hollowness and volume to them, which allows you to place uh, liquid or solid within. Uh, so that's what makes it ceramics. That's the difference between clay and ceramics. As ceramics has a process orientation uh, versus clay is its just own earthly existence, inert existence um, in the lithosphere. All right. Um, <clears throat> so there are three different types of clays in particular. There's what's called an earthenware, there's a stoneware, and there's a porcelain. And an earthenware is a very low fire uh, clay body. And it's very porous and it is often known as terracotta. So if you ever hear the word terracotta or hear about terracotta tiles or roofing, uh, those, are, um, those are earthenware clay bodies. <coughs> now what I mean by low fire is it can only go to a certain temperature, then it starts to melt and it becomes a glaze. All right. Then you get to the stoneware which is the second, and the stoneware has a much higher uh, mat maturation, all right? Maturation is when it starts to become stone, or what's known as vitrification, and then at that point, um, it holds very strongly. You would shut the kiln off, and then it would slowly cool down, and you would have this stone-like uh, surface or stone-like form. And then once it goes beyond maturation, then that's what I mean by it starts to become a glaze. It starts to slump, it starts to warp, and then ultimately if it goes too high beyond its maturation point, then it becomes a liquid known as a glaze. <coughs> so stoneware is a mid-range to high fire clay body, and then porcelain is uh, a really high fire material. Um, it can even go up to around 2,000 400, 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit without it warping or shifting its shape at all. All right, so those are the three main types of clay bodies. Um, the clay that we use in the studio at KCK is a stoneware. All right, it's a cone five stoneware. It's a very specific type of stoneware. And then in a lot of programs like at KU or K-State, you have um, the porcelains are heavily used as well as high fire stonewares. So depending on where you go and the different facilities that, you, that the college has, um, dictates what kind of materials we use. Like for example, in the high school or the secondary level, most of the time it's an earthenware or a low fire clay body that's being used. All right. Um, so throwing is just the idea of using the potter's wheel, which you all have seen when you've come into class. We have multiple potter's wheels that are laying around. And uh, you get, you take a, a, a mass of clay, you center it on the wheel, you throw it up and you make it hollow. All right, that's the throwing process using the potter's wheel. Um, let's see here. Oh yes, if you want to, you can uh, refer to my videos, the sculpture videos as well as the ceramics videos on YouTube to kind of get an idea of the hand building process. Um, I'm doing the coiling and pinching techniques right now and then I'll be doing slab built techniques for both of those classes. So that's a good way to kind of understand uh, the last chapter, which is sculpture, as well as understanding this chapter, the craft media. Now for decoration on ceramics, it's often um, the use of slips, which is just liquefied clay. So you would take your clay and then you would break it down into a liquid slurry and then you would add a colorant stain into that slurry, mix it up, and then you could get brown, you can get yellow, you can get blue, you can get red, you can get purple. And then you cover the surface of that pot and then you can do different techniques on that pot while it's still wet. Um, some techniques are called slip trailing, some techniques are called scraffito. And then that's that stage, it's whenever it's still wet. Then whenever it fires, it goes into a first firing called a bisque fire. Then it comes out and you can no longer add any of those slips to the surface, all right? They would just crack off. So at that point, you add glazes, and the glaze is the new surface decoration after it's been fired once, which is that bisque firing. Then after you put that second, that second a surface decoration known as the glaze on the surface, then it goes into a second firing called the glaze firing. 
All right, and that's when you start to see the liquefied or the glossy surfaces on the pottery or on the sculpture. All right. So again, the ancient Greeks heavily used uh, earthenware pottery in their uh, the terracotta in particular in in their making and their artisans of that time. If you're uh, looking at the painter, the oil jar with man holding a, a lid, you can see our lie you can see that there's different coloration. There's the black and then there is kind of the reddish brown. The reddish brown is the raw clay body and the black is a black slip that's been coated on the surface. And then where you see the red is where that black has been scraped away to reveal that raw clay body. And that's what's called scrapito. So if you look Closely, you can see that there's black outline details in the red. That's actually where either the artisan has gone in and drawn the black slip back in to get that definition or has removed the black slip just to leave that black line available to create that surface, uh, that surface technique and surface uh, definition. All right, so that's called slip slipware that's the black slipware on top of the terracotta and the scraffito technique All right then you have the incredible porcelain uh, forms coming from Asia in particular in China and the uh, Yuan dynasty when we're looking at the octagonal uh, ping vase All right so this is a good use of the porcelain clay body which originated in China originated in Asia China in particular and then moved into Japan and into Korea, into uh, lots of uh, min most many of those countries in that area. And then <clears throat> didn't really get to the Western countries until much later. So um, the, the porcelains originated in, in China in particular. And the blue surface that you see is what's called a cobalt wash. It's a cobalt painting. And cobalt is a natural oxide that occurs in the earth. And it's just brushing the design onto the surface of the pottery whenever it's either still wet or whenever it's been fired. Most likely when it's still wet because during this time, um, they, the, the kilns were just once fire. They weren't multiple fires. They wouldn't take a piece, make it, put it into a kiln, fire it once, bring it back out, which would be called the bisque temperature or the bisque firing, and then glaze it and then put it back in. They would do it all at once and do a once firing from 72 degrees Fahrenheit to most likely in this case, 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so that's a cobalt wash on the surface there. And then later in the slideshow, you'll look at more contemporary pieces like Betty Woodman. And Betty Woodman takes just your standard forms like your vases and your cylinders and throws them on the wheel, like with a divided vases a cubist. And then she comes in and then she uses this painterly palette on the surface uh, to give it this environment as if it's been camouflaged into this painting environment. So this is a good example or painted environment. This is a good example of where uh, ceramics can transition from your traditional aspects of function, which is equally important as the contemporary approaches of how can clay be more than just craft. It can actually become a fine art. All right. And then there's another example by Grayson Perry that you can look at again using a lot of surface decoration kind of brings back the idea of that Gresham piece that we looked at at the very beginning using the slips on the surface to give uh, using those colored slips on the surface and then removing some of it to reveal some of the raw clay body. All right. Then there's glass. There's uh, wide ranges of glass. There's stained glass, blown glass, inlaid various objects, um, and then also making it amorphous when it's hot. So what that means, it goes into the furnace, and then whenever it comes out, it's being rotated on this large rod, this blow rod, and you blow into the rod and it inflates the glass, or you just use it to rotate it and shift it and give it different uh, amorphous meaning very organic like shapes okay so it's a very fluid material it has to re remain fluid whenever it's being um, augmented meaning that they're adding more glass on top of it so for example if you have a ball of glass it goes in 
you bring it out, you blow on it, and then they want to do an inlay or they want to add a different colored glass on top of it, they have to have another rod that has that color uh, glass, that fritted glass on it, and then it drips onto the orb okay to make a certain design let's say a spiral on the orb and then it has to go back into the furnace to allow it to all congeal together so to speak it's not bake it's not cooking so nothing's really congealing there's no fat but it's the best way i can think of to describe it is to kneel it or to congeal it all together as one all right then of course there's stained glasses which were very relevant in the Middle Ages and the Gothic cathedrals which we'll look at whenever we get to the art history aspect of the class. And um, you can see, and we've already talked about the importance of stained glass. It gives it a sense of illumination, um, gives it a sense of uh, biblical storytelling as well um, in the past times that you see in the Bible uh, for in individuals that may not be well read or they may be illiterate. And so whenever they step into the uh, church or cathedral, you will see these stories, these biblical stories being told. And they can, re they can reference those windows through the stained glass, using stained glass, uh, based off of the information that the reverend or the uh, priest is giving uh, during the sermon. All right, so there's an example of the resurrection window um, for stained glass, a really great example of using glass as a craft media and the fine art aspects of it. I mean, obviously, this is art as worship, which we've talked about as one of the functions. And then there's Chihuly. I'm sure you've heard of Dale Chihuly, um, a, f a famous Seattle-based artist. And this is one of his basket sets. And this is inlaid glass, all right, where it's been the black glass has been inlaid with this yellowish kind of ochre, green-like glasswork. Um, I don't know a lot about glass, but, um, you know, this is an amorphous technique where the rim has been altered and shifted, where it's not perfectly circular. Um, it's actually been uh, manipulated on the top. So you can see the inlay with the black. All right. You can also see that there are other elements that are cocooned within this overall thin glass shape. Glass is very popular right now. Glass and ceramics are both very popular. They're, they're taking the whole idea of the craft realm and they're breaking through the craft wall into the fine art wall or into the fine art realm. Uh, both of them are doing it beautifully. Right, and there's just a, another example of uh, how glass can be used, kind of a more of a mixed media um, with, um, what's the name there? Sorry. With Mona, the nature, uh, Monte Ox Grand, uh, this is French, uh, Grenades, still life with hand grenades. So this is commentary, uh, making grenades out of glass. You know, why would someone do that? But at the same time, if you think about it, grenades can be like glass. When they blow, they, sh they, they create fragments and those fragments are what gets into the body and that's why they're so dangerous. So read up on some of the commentary on why um, she, Mona, Mona, chose to make glass grenades. Okay. And then metal. Again, with metal, um, we're talking about types of metals that aren't often used uh, for bronze, right? Or bronze casting for large uh, sculptures. Let's say sculptures that you would see done by uh, Rodin, um, you know, sculptures that we saw by Giacometti, sculptures um, are large stone sculptures, all right? So obviously stone and metal are different, but so we're looking at, again, a strong and formidable material. So uh, trying to manipulate something strong and formidable and make it, uh, alter it in a way to have an artistic uh, presence is very difficult. And some of the earlier metalsmiths would uh, create tools, vessels, armor, and weapons in particular. So a lot of the armor that you saw, let's just say, for example, the terracotta warriors that we see that are made out of clay from the Han Dynasty in China, um, the actual armor that was used during the Han Dynasty was all metalwork, mostly metalwork. Um, so that was some of the first formidable um, approaches to using metal uh, with metalsmiths uh, creating 
those uh, those incredible suits of armor. And then you can see how the uh, if we move forward with the basin in particular, which is made out of brass, right, inlaid with silver. So the whole thing is made out of brass, and then there are carvings where uh, the silver has been inlaid into it. So what that means is whenever the 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 ba the bas the basin um, the Damasius basin in Syria. Whenever it was made and formed, it was it had inlay or it was carved in uh, design. This design that you see that has the silver approach or has the silver surface was carved in, and that created um, an inlay. And then the silver went inside of that design, which is what's called the inlay. All right. So, and then there's some really cool silverware, which I like, the flatware. And it's, you know, it, you may look at it at first and be like, well, you know, is this really art? But then you look and it's made out of silver and copper and, uh, you know, stainless steel. And it's a combination of these really uh, popular or very expensive metals like silver and copper. And, uh, and then it combined with stainless steel, which is a very, I mean, it's not cheap, but it's more of an industrialist um, metal. Uh, so it's cool to kind of see it mixed together and it's a good way to kind of see that bridge between very fine material like silver and copper and kind of more working class material or metal like stainless steel and seeing them fused together like this, um, which is again that fusion on trying to bridge the craft and the art together. I think it's a really great example of that. Then there's wood, all right? Um, we looked at, in the last chapter, uh, Martin Purier, and uh, we looked at some of his wood pieces in particular, so we've had an opportunity to refer to those. So just kind of skim through the different wood pieces and see how uh, wood has been altered from just a functional form in the home or being used as uh, like a piece of furniture in the home to how it's transitioned into more of the fine art realm. Like for example, Anina uh, Bruin's nest chair. It's a chair, but it's made of all these different interwoven pieces are lam uh, laminated pieces of wood that are creating this almost nest-like environment. So it's starting to talk about, uh, it has commentary involved with it than it just being a fine-made chair that you sit in and rest upon. Uh, it's like, well, you know, what would be the reason to rest and sit in this chair? And how would you rest and sit in this chair with these different bands coming off of the areas where your legs would typically uh, uh, lay over whenever you're resting on the bottom of a chair. All right, so just kind of uh, scan through the wood area a little bit and um, also uh, spend some time in the textile. Uh, read about the weaving, the webs, uh, warps and webs, and the use of a loom. Um, that's very important uh, to understand how the webs and the warps on a loom are used to create the different patterns whenever it comes to textiles. Um, you know, there's also the use of uh, knitting and crocheting. That is um, a new and a very uh, popular uh, retrending kind of technique whenever it comes to fiber art or textile art. So uh, kind of look at that and look into that as well. And then one piece, a couple pieces I really want to talk about in particular is um, Babaldi, uh, uh, Babaldi, uh, the Allura's piece, which is the tapestry made with digitally operated, oops, digitally operated um, loom, all right, from the original photo collage. So this is a loom that's digitally making these different images while the strands are being warped and wet, which is really, really quite amazing. So whenever you string the warp and the wet for a piece of fabric, let's say a large rug, each string has to be you know, locked into the next one that's previous to it. That's what makes the design, that's what makes the incredible technique that you see. Um, so this is that plus digital images that are interlaced within it. So um, look at the overall image of it and then look at the detail shot, which is the following of the, uh, the world in a box. 
Okay, and you can see how the images is being um, interwoven with the, uh, the warp and the webs, uh, no pun intended. And the last one um, that I really want you to look at in particular, of course, is before you get to it, is um, looking at the um, Ardave carpet and um, Tabriz, a very beautiful tapestry. Some of the best tapestry comes from the Arabic countries. Uh, so spend some time looking at that one uh, because the, 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 the te textile and fiber work coming from that area of the world in particular is the best and that's where ever, everybody in the contemporary field of textile and fiber art refers back to to uh, get some of the best designs. Uh, so again, the Arabic countries of the world have led the charge with the incredible uh, tapestries that and fiber arts that we see around the world. And then there's... Um at the very end of the slideshow is Faith Ringgold, and Faith Ringgold is a great storyteller. So she uses her quilts to tell stories of her childhood, um, childhood of what she actually experienced, and then childhood of, of her imagination, and she combines the two. So really spend some time looking at Tar Beach. She actually has a book, a kid's book, that's based off of these this quilted series. So um, really look at uh, Faith Ringgold's work and see how she takes her own personal expression and and her imagination, right? That projective thought versus the receptive thought. Receptive is you're doing something that you see versus projected is something from your imagination. And how she takes the imagination of her childhood as well as the time that she spent with her family and kin um, and she takes both of them and then she just kind of interweaves them inter interweaves them together in these large quilts and the quilts actually have little stories there's narratives that's involved and uh, it really speaks volumes of her life uh, growing up as a child with her family and um, and how it starts to tell a story and comments on her own personal self-expression as well as a society around her and how she would dive into her imagination to imagination to sometimes um, uh, escape from that, so to speak. So enjoy it. Enjoy the slideshow. It's exciting. There's um, and um, I'll let you know what's coming up after and what's to be expected of this slideshow in the near future. Okay. Hope you all have a good day and a good weekend. Uh, take care and try to get some sunshine if you can. All right.